Okay, so it's officially one o'clock and we're going to start off this webinar. So, hi, my name is Hindi Zeisman Stegman and I'm the founder and CEO of the Art of Empowerment, which is a non-for-profit 501c3 and I'm your host today for our Victim to Victory webinar with our special 2G guest, Ellen Corman Mains. So our mission is to show how we can turn pain into action, tears into growth in order to experience the richness and transformative effect of our Jewish legacy. We are the children who were not to be born. However, our parents miraculously survived. And as the first generation, second generation, and third generation born after the Shoah, we are parents' jewels and the jewels of the Jewish community. So what does this mean? We are parents' treasures. And through our parents' stories and silences, we are bonded by memories whose echoes permeate our consciousness. We've been polished, admired, and overly protected. This status has been a burden, responsibility, and an obligation and a privilege. And each of us has extraordinary strengths and courage. And as children, we heard and felt and were surrounded by parent stories. Whether they chose to discuss their wartime experiences with us or not, we remain influenced by their lives because we cannot help be, but being affected epigenetically or otherwise in some way by our parents' past experiences and their behavior. We find ourselves carrying the echoes of the voices in our daily activities. The message about life we received from our parents was unique because their experiences were unique. So discovering how we are affected by the trauma of the Holocaust is step one. But then what? As we acknowledge, accept, forgive, and let go, we are free to live a healthy, joyous life filled with love and shalom and inner peace. So let's turn our pain into purpose, remember the past, heal the present to enhance our future. And I am thrilled to have um, a fellow 2G with us, Ellen Corden Mains. So let me tell you a little something about Ellen. Ellen's father was born in Kozienice, Poland in 1907. Her mother was born in Lodz, Poland in 1920. And they met in Paris in 1946, had their first child in 1948 and immigrated to Montreal in 1951, where Ellen was born. So in addition to being a child of Holocaust survivors, Ellen is a Buddhist teacher, an author, a speaker, and focusing guide. She began in Buddhist meditation at the age of 19 to understand the nature of suffering for herself and to help others. Along the way, she trained in other body, mind, and healing disciplines, exploring ways to integrate challenging life experiences and discover keys to healing. Though Ellen has taught at university, led workshops, and created self-coaching journey called The Magic Practice of Feeling Your Life, she is proudest of her journeys to Poland, which began in 2006 and continue annually, and the memoir about them called Buried Rivers. By the way, I have attached the link in the chat um, for her book called Buried Rivers, it's phenomenal. I, I highly recommend it. It's a spiritual journey into the Holocaust. The book not only research, researches her family's lost history, but explores deeper questions of faith, spirituality, trauma, family loyalty, and ancestral connection. Um, about the book, Rabbi Tzvi Ish Shalom, PhD founder of the Kaduma Institute writes, this is a compelling personal spiritual journey that crosses religious boundaries in order to tackle some of the deepest mysteries of life and death, revealing how the past, present, and future intersect in the very cells of our bodies. Buried River shows how we can more fully discover spiritual truth 
and personal healing through the conscious meeting of our ancestors as they appear to us in the here and the now. And the link to her website is also um, in the chat. So you'll be able to just click that. And for all of you that are here, I would appreciate put your name and um, where you're from in the chat. And along the way, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will deal with them. At the end, we'll have a question and answer period. So welcome, Ellen. That was a long intro. <laughs> Yes. So as a child of Holocaust survivors, how and what brought you to your journey of exploration of the Holocaust? Yeah, great opening question. Um, I think everybody's experience is different. Every survivor's experience is a little different or a lot different and, and us as their children. Um, for me, I think, you know, I was a quiet, shy, sensitive child. I was the second, I had an older brother and the boy, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of attention on boys and Jewish families and the firstborn boy. <laughs> and so I was kind of like the quiet one who I think absorbed a lot and I absorbed a lot of the I think stress and trauma of my mother. And, you know, nowadays we think in, in terms of, you know, gee, what was it like even to be in the womb of a person who five years earlier, you know, or eight years earlier or whatever, you know, had all their family members killed and, and they had to flee and they were in several camps and they were going from one country to another country, to a third country, to a fourth country, and then I'm born, you know, and just all of that. And so um, there was a lot of, I would say, stress, anxiety, survival anxiety, and, um, but also tremendous strength and, you know, just making a new life um, with my father. And um, for me, a lot of the fear and the sort of sense that of not trusting the world or the people around them, I think I tried to be like the calming one and to de-escalate the fear and the stress, but unaware of probably how much I was also holding it and absorbing it. And I think I also somehow just felt this deep sadness from, from childhood and this pain that I couldn't explain, you know, and even though at, I don't even know when I learned about the Holocaust, it felt to me like I, there was never a time I didn't know, but obviously consciously, uh, you know, there must have been a time I didn't know, but I'm not aware of that. It was just this sort of blanket. And I think what I sought as a young person was just a sense of freedom and space. And, um, and I didn't know what to do with the sadness. And I don't know that I even knew I was carrying it, you know, and then I think that's what attracted me to, you know, Buddhist meditation and to this particular teacher who had a huge influence on me. I met him and I had a talk with him on, and it happened to be a couple days before my 19th birthday. And he said, uh, he just looked at me and he said, how old are you? And I thought about the fact that I was turning 19 in three days, but I felt like I was carrying the weight of the world. So I just burst into tears and I felt, and I think that's why, you know, I think it's very hard for people uh, connected with the Holocaust or just Jews in general to, to, um, make peace with the fact that somebody might go quote unquote outside the religion for some for something they needed. But to me, it, Buddhism is not so much a religion, but um, a way of dealing with suffering, really, and with one's own experience. And it's more of a psychology in a way of how to be human, how to be healthy, a healthy human being. 
and open rather than closed. To me, that that's a lot about this journey is how can you be open? And so anyway, that's sort of how it started was I, I, I somehow was able to make a relationship with this pain and um, or at least on a certain level, or at least acknowledge it was there. And um, and then much, much later, um, uh, as if people read the book or, and as you know, um, unexpectedly in my 50s, I happened to be at a meeting, a conference in Germany. It happened to be the 60th anniversary of the um, liberation of Auschwitz, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is uh, which was established by the United Nations and it's um, commemorated a lot in Europe, not as much in the U.S., where we, uh, you know, mainly have, um, you know, the, the spring date for commemoration of the Shoah. Anyway, I was on this train and I had an experience of feeling this energy, this very heavy energy that was sort of lingering, that seemed to be lingering in the atmosphere. And somehow I was just tuning into that, maybe because I was in Germany. Um, I can't really explain it, except that I was looking out the window and it was January and I was looking at chain link fences and chimneys and the environment somehow spoke to me of concentration camps and the dismal situation of all those people. So, um, <clears throat> Something you know, really. I just, I just want to stop you for a second, Ellen. There, I think for many of us, we have those moments and we don't even pay attention to them. Mm. Whether it's you meet someone and there is an energy that something is. Um, for me, recently, it was going to the dentist office and sitting in the dentist chair. Mm. And there was just something about the dentist drilling on my teeth took me back to the Holocaust. Now, was I hallucinating? Was I really there? Did I hear my mother's story? I don't know. But I think I, I want people to understand how very often things come to us energetically and we very often negate them or think we're, you know, so continue your story. I didn't want to interrupt, but I think it's Yeah, no, that's great. That's, it is great. I mean, at a certain point, I, I much later in the book, I, in one of the journeys, um, I was planning to go to Buchenwald and um, to meet Eva Kaur, uh, who was one of the Mengele twins and who has done all this work on forgiveness. And I wanted... I had spoken to her on the phone and I wanted to meet her at this one day event happening. We actually um, brought her to Toronto mm, in the early nineties. Um, and she spoke for a, to mm, the Toronto community. But she had the same problem. I think when she went to the dentist or the eye doctor um, and I forgot, there was another reason I mentioned that, which has just flown out of my mind, but anyway, yes. So, uh, I was on the train, yeah, and I <clears throat> really felt like something hit me right in my heart. And it had, a, a, it just socked it to me and it, and it made me feel also ill. And it sort of showed me that there was something there that needed to be related to. And so it took me about nine months to figure out what, what that was about, but <clears throat> the basic message that I ended up with was, if you believe in basic goodness, if your spiritual practices have really taught you something about that, then that would be something to reconcile with this unbelievably unspeakable, you know, genocide that your own people went through. And um, that many of them who have died and you know maybe people have different beliefs about what happens to you after you die but that it would affect not only people living but people that we are connected to those who have died and i think that's a big message in my book is this this sense of you don't kind of believe it you don't want to believe it and you, you don't think it's possible but then you feel 
wow, there, there is this energy out there that is that, and, and probably many people who have not completely overcome what happened to them. And some people moved forward and some people could not. And so anyway, I think that's part of being tuned in energetically is that not everything is, you know, in flesh and blood in front of us. And that we are connected on that, on those levels, sometimes beyond what we know. Yes, absolutely. And then, and then after nine months, I, I, I thought, well, how can I possibly, what, what would be a step to do this? And, and then suddenly I saw this word Poland, like in the inside my head, like a little billboard, you know, oh, I think I should go to Poland and which never occurred to me before. And, um, you know, I was lucky to have a friend who kind of really, and many friends actually, who encouraged me and thought I was, thought I was inspired. And, and meanwhile, I was thinking, well, do you really think I should do this? And, and got up my courage and, and went. And then it was just kind of astonishing um, what that opened up for me to go. You know, it's interesting that sometimes it takes um, a low point in our life or something or a trauma to to push us forward um for me in 1989 it was my bankruptcy mm. and all of a sudden i was looking at who was i what was i and i also decided with a girlfriend to go to poland at that time to do a retracing of my route mm. so um continue with your mm. woman adventure because yours was different than mine. <laughs> mm, mm. I just remembered why I brought up the Eva Core thing, which was there. I, I was looking, I, I put out something on, on, in some network of uh, people I was connected with saying, Hey, does anybody want to come to Buchenwald with me? And this, um, somebody I maybe had a just light acquaintance uh, with uh, decided to come. And it was, it was like that, that thing you were talking about, how something triggers. And it, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and there's a, an old uh, mining place at the top of the hill. And there's, there was some kind of chimney there. And she, so she's in the middle of Boulder, Colorado. She's not even Jewish she saw this chimney and it so there are what i've also discovered is so many people who have a connection with the holocaust a deep connection who are not jewish so that's been that sort of eye-opening for me just how huge how many people on the planet uh feel deeply connected to the holocaust and to what happened and obviously, it's it's the point that people that humanity hasn't gotten the lesson either, and that genocides are continuing, and hyper nationalism is continuing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, we're not going to really dwell dwell on Buchenwald there, except um, I know that when I, for my experience, when I went to Buchenwald, it was still. It was just the DDR was East Germany, whatever. And there was myself and a friend. And the lecturer was um, talking about all the different aspects of Buchenwald and all the people that had died and all the terrible things that had happened and omitted the fact that Jews were actually there. And I found that a lot on my trip. Maybe you didn't, but... Um, sort of the narrative, including the pain of the Jews, very often was missing. Mm -hmm. Somehow today, it still is too sometimes. Mm. Yeah, but I think you went at a really tough moment um, because, you know, the whole communist period was one where everything was frozen and all everything that had happened to the Jews was completely obliterated and, you know, nothing was known, nothing was looked into. And then it started to shift in the 90s quite dramatically. So the, my first trip was 2006. And um, uh, by that time, there was a lot of interest and exploration and, you know, how things go in cycles. Absolutely. And shut down and then suddenly they open up. And so, yeah. So tell us, I know that you 
went and spent a lot of time and have spent a lot of time in Lodge, which is your mother's hometown, which is actually my mother's hometown also. Um, and I'm actually, I'm just going to sound, I don't, I, normally I never use this word, but your experiences of going to Lodge Poland, I'm actually jealous of them because mine wasn't so great. So tell us about Lodge for you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that I think maybe that's why you're doing this is because it, it didn't it didn't satisfy you. And so you're you're still on that quest, you know. Um, for me, um, there was this uh, sense of deep recognition on a like cellular level. Um, my mother was born there. My grandmother was born there. And uh, many generations before that, in the general area, you know, maybe uh, an hour away or two hours away or something like that. Um, and I don't know why, but um, there was a sense like something inside me recognized, recognized a feeling. I guess that's the only way to talk about it. It was a feeling. And because it was so deep, it was like a, a sense of, and, and like, you don't remember, but you, you feel it as if it's familiar. It's sort of like a kind of a deja vu or something. And um, so there was a sense of being welcomed and being at home in some way, even though I was a stranger, I only had a few words of Polish, I was terrified, you know, regularly terrified, but I would regularly find people helping me everywhere. And um, in one, one, after I'd been there about three days, and just getting there, that was not the first place I went, it was the first place that I went on my own, and just got into a cab and said, you know, take me to a hotel that's not too expensive. And then I didn't like that hotel. So I found another one. And, and, um, but after I moved to this, I was moving to this second hotel and I was just looking for a cup of coffee. And I went into this little pastry shop, was sitting down by the window, you know, Polish lace on the window. And I was drinking the coffee and I suddenly thought, I wonder if my mother was ever right here where I am. And then I thought, well, maybe not in this building, but she must have walked down this street because I'm downtown. And when I had that thought, it was like my connection with my mother opened up and I just felt her energy. And then through that, I just felt this wave of something I could only describe as a kind of love and welcoming and this feeling of we're so glad you're here. So again, who are those people? I don't know. Is it, um, that's what I mean by the, the unexpected blessings. To me, that was one of the, if not the greatest blessing of my life, was to have grown up feeling like, what am I doing in this family? Who are these people? Who am I? What am I doing here? I feel so, um, you know, everything felt so narrow and difficult and then suddenly to feel this sense of recognition and love and we're really glad you're here. <laughs> I mean, this was like um, a big it's blessing. Funny that you me. say you found your your love for your family in Poland. Um, well, no, I loved my family before that. That's there's a no doubt about type that. Of a different type of love. Let's but say. I felt this different energy. Oh, I felt energy. This okay. Big energy of love and expansiveness and joy, really. And it's like, you know, and then I felt this confusion. Well, I'm here to look into the Holocaust and all this suffering. Why am I experiencing joy? You know, so that was, that's always been a kind of almost strange conundrum, but maybe it's just that there's something, there's something karmically or genetically, whatever, that I'm able to, open up to there and and some connection with the past and you know and then of course I, I became I became I even though I didn't go there 
specifically to research my family, I went more to look into this question of, of the, the suffering and the pain and was there some way I could bring something helpful to that situation. And, but then what happened was people started just taking me to the archive and, uh, you know, I, information started coming my way. And then, of course, it became interesting to follow that. And so I think that's one of the, um, I don't know if you're going to ask me what I think the role of the two Gs are, but I have a kind of answer I could give you. If, if, if that's what's coming to you at this moment, then that's what's coming. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, again, it's so individual, but, um, but many of us obviously feel driven almost in some way. And one way, obviously, is sometimes the memories aren't there, the facts aren't there, the story isn't there. So sometimes it's actually recovering the information, you know. And uh, like the information that I was given was almost nothing. And then some of it that I got secondhand was not code totally correct, but more, it was just mostly missing. Well, and I think so, for, so many, for so many of us, we were scared to even ask our parents yeah, growing absolutely. up. Yeah. So, and now most of them are gone. Yeah. And, and I, I know for when I went back to Poland, I, my journey was why, why did it happen? How could it happen? Why and how was so pervasive for me, mm. you know, and as two G's, I agree with you. I think I've always been kind of searching for answers and, and trying to make peace with what is. Um, before you go on, I just want mm -hmm. to ask you, what gave you the courage? Because I know that for so many of us, our parents put the fear of God, if you want to say, into never stepping foot in Poland or Germany or Austria, you know, Romania, I, they would never go back and, and they would never want their children to go back. I think part of it was fear that something could happen. But you, I'm sure I would be surprised and maybe I'm wrong that your parents were happy that you said, oh, I want to go to Poland. Well, they, they had passed away. So uh, my, my mom died in 1998. My father died before that in 1990. Uh, okay. Um, and remember, he was born in 1907. You know, That's he was, true. Yes. Was, um, so uh, they very well would have said that, I'm guessing. But anyway, they were no longer in the picture. And um, they had never specifically said that to me either. Um, and in fact, my uncle, so this another survivor, my mother's younger brother, he had taken his family, uh, his immediate family, to Poland. Um, my mother didn't go. I don't know if she was invited. I don't know if we were invited. Um, okay, courage. Um, yeah, like, as I said, I, I, I think partly it was the Buddhist practice, and it was the this principle of being willing to not know and not have everything nailed down. So it's kind of a willingness to be a little bit uncertain. And that is a scary place. And in fact, when I talked about the, the Buddhist psychology, it's basically that factor of uncertainty that every human being has about their existence. And then what do we do? We tend to try to secure all, ourselves in all kinds of ways so that to eliminate that feeling of uncertainty about who we are, what we're doing, um, and just feeling solid and, you know, that there's that nothing's going to threaten us. So there was already this sort of openness and probably a lot of experience of, of really not being sure of things. But I think it was that experience on the train that actually made me feel for the first time that, 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 that this strange paradox that I was born into this Jewish family, 
Polish parents, um, this heavy history, and being Jewish was very, very important to them. And then my starting to practice Buddhist meditation was very not welcomed. It would, did not go well. And so the fact that I had to reconcile these things caused me a lot of pain. And I never wanted to cause any pain to my parents. That's the last thing we wanted to do to our parents was give them any more pain. Uh, so when this event happened on the train, it was, it was like this opportunity to bring something I had gained maybe back to, you know, to bring these parts of my existence together and um, to do some good and it was really it, it really felt to me like it, it was the thing that seemed like it would give my it gave my life some purpose or meaning and I was just willing to to take that chance I would also was had some really good friends and one friend in particular who had recently gone on a journey and without having everything figured out and um you know, sort of trusting the universe more. And I chose to do that. And it, it kind of worked out. How important do you think it is for us, for two Gs, three Gs, to um, get the answers, let's say, or try to have some more knowledge, whether it's knowledge, closure, not even sure what the word is, um, if they were left not knowing anything, parents didn't speak, don't know much, um, there's nobody to talk to anymore. Um, and I know for a lot of people, I hear all the time, I wish I, I should have, I could have, I didn't. And here they are today. What do you think, Ellen? Mm. Again, it's up to every person, you know, but I think that if you kind of have that feeling like I wish I knew, it's worth spending some time um, seeing what you can find out because there's so many records online available now and so many organizations and ways of searching and uh, Jewish genealogical groups everywhere. And um, I would say, like I wasn't really interested in doing that kind of search, but then what I discovered is that when you, when you find out a piece of information, it's as if it fills, it, it, it creates some ground in this place where there's a gap, where there's like a hole, like we have these feelings of these big holes inside. So then you get this one piece of information or even like the names of, of a couple ancestors, or grandmothers, whatever it is, great grandmothers, fathers. And then it's like you become available, it opens the door. So like a, like a kind of scaffolding to do the feeling work. So it's kind of feels hard to do the feeling work when you don't have any information. But I'm not saying it absolutely has to happen that way. I think just doing some people who can just do the work on the emotional level, if they're feeling that, that need to do it, that is a great service for themselves and for everyone else and their children going forward. But sometimes filling in a bit of information kind of gives you the, like, I don't know, the, the springboard for then feeling the emotions that are coming along with it, you know. And even just on the level of grief, you know, like, I went to Lodge, uh, well, I, I went there this last fall, but, and then I, I wasn't there for a um, couple years because of the pandemic. Um, but the last time before the pandemic that I went, I was able to retrieve some information quite easily from um, the archive in Lodge and also myself. And I gave this friend of mine one little piece of information and her grief was so great that she decided she didn't want any more information. So that's another interesting thing. Some people don't want to deal with it. Um, but I think grief, grief is a really interesting topic. Like, and I think there's grief, there's different kinds of grief. And 
if I could, I want to read this just one sentence from um, this book called The Tears of the Ancestors uh, by a Dutch man, um, Dan van Kampenhout. And it says, we, the living, are the body of our ancestors. And in our bodies, we carry all the tears they could not cry during their lifetimes. And when we allow their tears to be cried through us, something is being made whole through the generations. We are engaged in tikkun olam, repairing the world. But I think for some people that grief is, there's so much, I don't know whether it's blame or resentment um, that comes with it, that's kind of attached to it. So there's something about grief that doesn't have resentment, but is can, can move more easily, can flow more easily, that, that can actually, if you can touch in with the grief without feeling like you have to blame somebody for it or blame yourself for it, it can move and it's more open, more loose. Uh, and it can feel like a relief. And that there is something about touching that core of suffering. And honestly, I feel that if we can touch that in ourselves, we're touching it also for all those generations that are connected to us. You know, it's interesting when you use um, grief and suffering and um, for so many of our parents, when their family members were murdered, they didn't get an opportunity to grieve. Right. There was no sitting Shiva. They just had to move on the next day, go out and work, or, or they were in hiding or whatever the situation was. They did not get a chance to grieve. And I think that has been, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I believe that's been a missing link for a lot of them. They're, they continued grieving because they never grieved. They didn't have that period of time, you know, mm. and I didn't have any family other than my parents really that were the closest to me because everybody perished. And so I didn't even understand what um, a sitting Shiva was. Mm. until my father died in 1998 I had no idea the purpose um the importance Mm -hmm. and I believe that they continue grieving and energetically we as the children picked up that sadness within them we didn't know what we were picking up but they were in constant grief even when they were happy and having a good time it only lasted so long yeah. And so we had to learn how to give ourselves permission. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, I think that's very accurate. Yeah, that grief is such an important uh, thing that has to happen to honor them, to go through the transition, to let go, um, to make peace with something that is very, very difficult. Yeah. And, you know, now that I'm talking to you, something just came to me that on Yom Kippur or whether it's Yom Kippur or your site or, or whatever it is for you. Um, now I have to say um, Kaddish for my parents yearly. Right. Mm. And I light a candle for them. But I have never really sat and mourned my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, my ancestors. I have not done that honoring Mm. ceremony Mm. of mourning my ancestors as individual people, Mm. even though I never knew them. Mm. And I'm thinking now in talking to you that that could be very healing Mm. for the intergenerational trauma that we carry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you could just maybe add a candle for them, you know, um, at the same time, just include them, just widen the scope of what you're already doing, you know, just like, yeah, just add to it, because your heart is already there in that place. And you might find that it just opens your heart more to do that. 
but also as soon as you started saying this, I just thought, you know, you're also doing it right now with this podcast, with this webinar, you know, <laughs> so. Well, I think that for a lot of us, um, we, uh, you know, our parents wanted us to be happy and to go on and not to dwell on the past. And very often in families where you've got more than one child, right? It's like, I've got three brothers and of course they were not affected by the Holocaust, um, nothing, you know, and so they don't want to talk or deal or, or think about it. Um, and maybe for them it works. And um, in, in many families, you've got one that has really taken on that role for the family, right? Yeah, yeah, seems to be the case. And now what about the next generation? How involved is the third generation or even the fourth generation? Well, I guess, uh, I mean, it does seem like the third, there's a lot of 3G people who maybe their parents were too close to it. They were just too, um, maybe their childhood were, were just too difficult, you know, and they, they just, you know, did the best they could, but it's the three G's who somehow have enough space from it. Cause it does take some kind of, you know, space and different differentiation almost to say, wait a minute, Hey, I'm really interested in this, you know? So um, it's very, I think it could just as easily be three G's um, four G's. I just don't know. I mean, I don't know four G's. I don't think very much. Um, well, I have. I, I, I guess have. I, do. I have. Five of them. I have some, what? <laughs> I've got five grand boys. Aha! <laughs> uh Aha! -huh, uh -huh. Well, you might know more then. Um, but what was the question about? Uh, it's just you know we talk about Lador, 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 Midor, Lador from one generation to the mm. next, mm. and for those of us who maybe our siblings didn't get involved or talk or anything, I'm wondering how the next generation or the following is taking up the torch. Yeah, it does. It's a little hard to predict, but it just seems like whatever isn't, whatever is out there to be healed is likely to be passed on, you know, and certain children, they, they, they're, they're there maybe to take that on, you know, part of why they're here is they're willing to take it on. They want to take it on. Um, yeah. So what advice do you have for people who are unsure um, how to relate to being a descendant of Holocaust survivors? Um, well, well, basically, if they're interested uh, in looking into it, I think the more curiosity and the less prejudgment, the better. So just that curiosity, just that willingness, um, maybe to find out a little bit more than they knew already, and, and then to touch in with the emotional level. And especially, I think, um, just also openness to the human complexity of on, on both sides, on the, on the side of the victims and the perpetrators. Um, you know, for me, this question of basic goodness, like how this question of basic goodness was not so much externalized about how, how could it was, how could human beings have done this? But when I started going, going there and looking into all of this and reflecting on my own experience, I also had to touch in with how damaged my own sense of goodness was, you know, why did not I not always feel basically good, basically okay? You know, was it my own shame, my own, um, feeling of unworthiness, my lack of self-esteem, you know, all of those things that, that are partly um, uh, come along with the package of being a child of survivors, you know, 
possibly, or in my case. So um, I think the most important thing is just not, not thinking that people are black and white. And um, so that curiosity and that openness opens something up. It opens up the possibility for more information to come, for more healing to come, for more, and also to make links with people, with, with human beings of, who are like you and also not like you. And, um, you know, I want to share, if I could, this, 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 what I grokked from this story that my uncle recorded before his death when he knew he was dying of leukemia and he decided to record his memories from childhood. And I'm so grateful he did because a few, even though he was about eight years younger than my mother, there were some nuggets of information about their life in Poland that I would not have, except that he recorded these, these memories. And in one case, so he was in the large ghetto. At some point, the family was, you know, in one of the last transports going to Auschwitz. He stayed at Auschwitz and um, made himself useful to the Germans. And he was there until the death marches in, in January. And he tells this story about how he um, took a lot of chances and, um, you know, was clever enough to survive. And because he came from a family that made shoes, he got himself a job making shoes or fixing shoes. And then he, he told his capo, you know, he's the guy over him, that he could make shoes in one day. And so he started so the Germans started to approach him and um, have him make shoes for their, I don't know, their children. I don't know who. And um, so he said, well, he needed a certain kind of good leather. And they gave him this leather that wasn't very soft. So he um, apparently stole somebody else's boots, hid the leather under somebody else's pillow so that he wouldn't be killed for stealing these boots. And he tells the story. So first of all, you can see how he, his own human frailties, his own, um, you know, he was doing what he needed to do to survive. Um, but he also says, he was, says he was lucky, he was looked after, he took chances. Um, and he describes a situation where he was alone with these German officers who would come. And he said, somehow, when you were with the Germans one at a time, you could feel their humanity. If they were together, three of them together, forget it. And this is the truth, God's truth. And what I wrote about this, there's a little bit more to the story, but I know I'm not going to get into too much of it. But he was saying at the end of his life, and this was the first time he could bring himself to talk about what had happened. You know, it took him 60 years to tell the story. But he was saying that he could feel the humanity of these people when they were individually with him. And yet when they got together, then they had to sort of, you know, it was the peer pressure of belonging to their group and doing what was expected of them. And so this whole idea that people were completely black or completely white, good or bad, that it, it's not like that. And that he himself, I mean, he was somebody I had a hard, hard time with throughout my life. So, uh, and then this sort of looking into his life and, you know, created a bond between us. So just the complexity of human interaction and how we tend to solidify and judge and want to make people all bad or all good. And so there's something about just the, the, the openness and the curiosity to touch into things 
without deciding in advance, this is bad. And then that, of course, why would you want to look into something that's bad? You, we don't. You if know, I'm going, to sh I'm going to share something with you right now that has been bothering me about myself the last few days with what's going on in the Ukraine. Mm. Um, I used to hear from my father all the time that the Ukrainians were in many, in many cases worse than the Germans and the Ukrainians were this and the Ukrainians were that. So now with this, what's going on, many people were posting on Facebook, you know, pray for the Ukraine. And I'm a very spiritual, loving person. And I don't want anything to happen to anybody on either side. And I realized that I was carrying within me, though, a resistance. There was something that I was holding on to from what I'd heard from my father that didn't allow me to totally freely just say, I, you know, I openly pray for the, for, for, and, and, and I've been really um, looking at this the last few days and saying, Hindi, this is so contrary to who you are. How oh. is it that just from your childhood of hearing that, I don't know how many times I heard it, it's sitting inside you. And you don't even realize that it's there. And I actually had to work on myself to release that energy. Thank God I can say today, I don't feel that. But it didn't come with a puff. I had to really go deep and look at myself, you know. And I was, by the same token, raised by a father who, after the war, had German partners. And he said, Hindi, I can't hold the, these German boys responsible. They wouldn't do anything to me. So there was the dichotomy of the message, right? And so I don't know if anybody else out there is feeling what I'm feeling or I felt, but I, I, mm. there is no black and white, Ellen. I agree with you. Right. Percent. And the more exactly. we hear stuff and we don't look at it or examine what is within our own consciousness, you know, then how can we help to repair the world if we're right. caring? and harboring. And we want to, you know, I think even if, you know, we think that by being loyal to our parents and holding that grudge that we're being loyal and good, but, you know, I think we have to see, see the, no, that's not the best way to do that. That's not the best way to honor them and to be loyal to them and to, to freeze it, you know? So I think not freezing, just staying, staying open and touching our own pain um, you know, in an honest, genuine way is, and then whatever we feel called to do, to do it the best we can. So for a second here, we have a question, um, because we're going to start to run out of time. And um, Panina wrote, I enjoy your presentation. Thanks. Um, you had your train experience and your thrill to you are a spiritual person. What do you think of Gilgul, uh, the Hebrew word for reincarnation? Yeah, well, I I, th I think it's a real thing. <laughs> I think I think that um, we we're probably not here just once. That's my my sense of it. And I have read that um, many of the survivors, children of survivors came back very quickly. And in some cases, they were not necessarily Jewish um, during the Holocaust, but came back for the lessons that they had to learn mm -hmm. the other way. And I don't mm -hmm. want to go too deep into this area, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um... I think we could have died in the Holocaust ourselves. I also think we could have been German. And uh, uh, when before I got into going to all these uh, uh, journeys to Poland, I actually had that sense that that was very possible in my case. I was actually at doing at a program, and I was a discussion group leader, and everyone in my group was German. 
And <laughs> afterwards, I just started having this very strange feeling and that perhaps I had been one of them um, and that this was my, my opportunity to experience it from the other side, partly because I had felt such uh, grief, such helplessness to be able to change the situation. So that was the flashback I had. Whether I imagined it, I don't know, but I felt so much grief that I wanted to rectify the situation somehow, that I wasn't sure I'd done everything I possibly could, you know. Um, but maybe I was also tuning into those, to how those Germans were feeling. So I, I'm not, you know, I can't say what really happened, but I definitely think that's probably the case. Okay. I don't know if anybody else, are there any other questions? This is your opportunity to ask Ellen. Um, she's had a wealth of knowledge here. And um, I will wait for a question. No. So Ellen, let me ask you, um, as we're getting to our close, what would you like to leave our audience with? Oh. Um, I guess what inspires me the most about going to Poland uh, is not only the feeling that I just feel good there, but this feeling of um, really making very genuine and deep connections with the Poles, the, the, the Christian Poles. And uh, this feeling of crossing of boundaries, you know, when we go beyond our, you know, immediate comfort zone and connect with people from other countries. I'm not just talking about the Holocaust, but it happens, you know, it's, 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 it's part of the richness for me of being there is making these connections. And it seems to restore something that was lost in terms of dignity and respect and this feeling that humanity is actually possible, you know, capable of doing that as opposed to what's happening in the world today with this tremendous polarization, which is also happening in Poland and it's happening here. Um, but there are also a tremendous number of people really working so hard to commemorate Jewish, um, the Jewish communities, the former Jewish communities that existed who are not Jews in Poland. So as much as it's true there are anti there's anti-Semitism, there is also more than more, not even equal, more people, in my opinion. Um, but it certainly, again, it's that not condemning people and willing to find out and willing to make connections. So to me, this idea of crossing boundaries, um, opening oneself up, um, that's been the biggest value of being in Poland. And yeah. Wonderful. And, yeah, encourage anybody interested in doing that to be in touch and read the book and um, yeah. So I'm going to post again in the chat, um, paste, and hopefully it's going to, um, the link for Ellen's website is www.ellencorman, that's K-O-R-M-A-N, M-A-I-N-S dot com. There is a link to her book, which I highly recommend, and I will send that out again. Um, I'd like to let you know that I'm doing these webinars on a monthly basis, the last Sunday of the month at one o'clock. Decided to do it one o'clock to allow our friends in Israel and in other time zones to join us. If anyone would like to be a guest, then please email me. And my email is Hindi Stegman, that's H-I-N-D-Y-S-T-E-G-M-A-N at gmail.com. Um, also, I invite you to join. I started a Facebook group, Victim Hyphen Victory. It's a private Facebook group for descendants of Holocaust survivors. I did put the link in the chat. Um, it's an opportunity for us to share pictures, events, 
Um, I know there's numerous um, Facebook groups, and I think this is going to be a very valuable one. There's also replays on there of the webinars. And if you have any um, specific ideas for me, I'm open. Um, and on that note, I think, yeah, so the next, next webinar is going to be um, Sunday, March 27th. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Uh, Ellen, I thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. You brought so much information and some of the things that we don't always talk about, you know, because everything is energy, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we realize what we're feeling is energy. And so um, this is a great way to open up to all kinds of new possibilities. So thank you again. And the replay will be available in the next day or so. Thank you so Bye -bye. much, Nikki. Yeah. Thank you.